Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Domination versus Cooperation, featuring Rianne Eisler. Rianne Eisler is a social systems scientist, cultural historian, and attorney whose research, writing, and speaking has transformed the lives of people worldwide. Dr. Eisler pioneered the expansion of human rights theory and action to include the majority of humanity, women and children. Her research provides a new perspective on our past, present, and possibilities for the future, including a new social and political agenda for building a more humane and environmentally sustainable world. Her book, The Chalice and the Blade, Our History, Our Future, had a big influence on my own perspective on human culture in general and patriarchy specifically, as did her 1988 lecture with Terence McKenna, Man and Woman at the End of History, so it was a real pleasure to spend some time talking to her. This is a special edition of Voices for Nature and Peace, in which I team up with Patrick Farnsworth of the Last Born in the Wilderness podcast. Thank you to Patrick for the invitation to collaborate and for handling the recording. Check out Patrick's podcast at the link in the show notes. Dr. Eisler, thank you for joining us. We've got Calibri Tier Sonam Bloom here. Uh, I guess I'm taking the lead on this. We're doing a collaborative interview, and uh, I'm excited to release this episode on both of our uh, respective podcasts. Um, so, um, Dr. Eisler, you know, something that we talked about in our correspondence before we began this was uh, we really wanted to talk about the research and work that you've done discussing domination and partnership systems and some of the key features of each of these paradigms and how societies look, how they operate when they're in both of these um, different paradigms. Um, but something that we wanted to tie into at the beginning was to talk about your experiences, your childhood experiences, um, and how they relate with what's going on uh, contemporarily in the United States, um, as we're seeing right now play out um, with Donald Trump, uh, the Republican Party, uh, just the whole trajectory that we're going down just in the past few years, if not just a few months. Um, and we wanted to really ask respectfully if you'd be willing to talk about your childhood experiences and how that informed your work how that got you to where you are today, as far as your work goes, um, but also, you know, how this informs your understanding of what's happening right now in the world. So if you'd be, if you'd be willing to talk about that, we would really appreciate it. Of course. Uh, as you know, I have a great deal of passion for this work, uh, which is the work of cultural transformation that is so urgently needed. And that passion is rooted uh, as you uh, alluded to uh, in my early childhood experiences uh, in terms of the conceptual framework I've introduced, which is the partnership domination social scale. I was born in Europe in a time that oriented very closely to the domination end of that scale, the rise to power of the Nazis, first in Germany and then in my native Austria. So from one day to the next, my whole world was really uh, rent asunder. Um, I, I saw my father uh, being uh, really pushed down the stairs by a gang of Nazis that came to our home on Crystal Night, which was so-called because of all the glass that was shattered in Jewish homes and synagogues and businesses. It was the, the, the first official uh, Nazi uh, night of terror uh, against Jews. Uh, and um, But I also saw something else. I my mother recognized one of the men who came uh, as a 
young man who had been an errand boy for the family business, and she got, got furious. She said, how dare you do this to this man who has been so kind to you? I want him back. And by a miracle, she was not killed. Many people were killed that night. And by another miracle, she managed to obtain his release and we fled. Uh, we fled to Cuba. My parents, of course, some money passed hands, uh, you know, uh, all, all, all along the way. Uh, my parents were also able to obtain an entry permit uh, to to Cuba, uh, and uh, again, um, it was it was a complete uh, complete uh, metamorphosis of my life, because from relative affluence, uh, I grew up in the industrial slums of Havana. Uh, really, uh, it it was quite a shock. So this led me to questions that I think many of us have asked why, when, as I saw with my mother, uh, we humans have such an enormous capacity for caring and for empathy uh, and, and really for what I call spiritual courage, you know, the courage to stand up against injustice out of love. Uh, why has there been so much... Uh, insensitivity and cruelty and violence. And my research, really, uh, many years later, of course, uh, was to answer that question. And it did. I, I, uh, my work is designed to, um, identify what are the conditions that support our human capacities for uh, well, for consciousness, for caring, for creativity, for empathy, rather than, because we also have those, uh, our capacities for insensitivity, cruelty, violence, and destruction. And that eventually led me uh, to this new uh, conceptual framework introduced in my book, as well as to identify, and we'll hopefully get to this sometime, as we speak, uh, what are the foundational changes we have to make so that we don't keep having these regressions that you mentioned to authoritarianism, uh, to cruelty, to violence. And so that's how that, I mean, that's the, the when you, when you came up with domination and partnership as being the two, I suppose you could say foils to one another. Um, you were seeing this not just in your life, but you were seeing this in history too. Absolutely, Calibri. Uh, these are really social categories that go far, far beyond the ones that we're used to, like right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, uh, Northern, Southern. Um, they go to foundational matters. And I want to emphasize this because, and, and, and to ask our listeners to really join me in, in, in leaving their comfort zones of these old categories behind, at least while we're talking and hopefully after that too. Uh, because linguistic psychologists have long told us that the categories provided by a culture by a language actually channel our thinking so that it is almost impossible to see other alternatives. And our conventional categories, uh, really, if you think about it, none of them, as I set out on this research, none of them help answer the question of, of my childhood. You know, how can we create a more conscious, caring, uh, creative, equitable, uh, sustainable world, because there have been repressive and regressive regimes in all these categories, whether it was Nazi Germany, you know, secular and uh, Western, uh, whether it is Khomeini's Iran or the Taliban uh, uh, or, or ISIS, Eastern, religious, uh, really, uh, 
but but there's also something else. Not only does my work uh, look at the whole span of our history, including the millennia uh, of our prehistory before deciphered written records, but it also includes uh, the whole of humanity, unlike our conventional categories, because if you really think about it, uh, all these categories either marginalize or ignore the majority of humanity, women and children. And if you do that, you cannot see what you see using the partnership domination social scale as the lens, which are root causes. And what we have to do to really change from domination to partnership. Hmm. Do you feel it's frustrating? Because when you talk about this, it, it's something that I, I've tried to explore in my own way, which is the big question around what human nature is. Uh, I find it such a big thing and so complex of a thing that it really to try to say that we're naturally warlike or we're naturally this or that. You know, people will often project what they see around them onto others and onto the past. And do you get a sense that that whole question is tainted by that, uh, by the kind of conditioned understandings that we have about what human nature is that maybe we just have never seen what it's actually like to live in a partnership society. So we just imagine that those are myths or stories that are told. Um, do you have, I guess, maybe more concrete examples of what a partnership society would look like, not only in the past, but also in the present? Well, let me first address the question that you bring up, uh, the story that we've been told about human nature, which, whether it's original sin, whether it's selfish genes, is the same story. Uh, we're bad, that's human nature, and therefore we have to be rigidly controlled from the top, right? Whether by God or by a, so his so-called representatives here on earth or some dictator, some strong man, etc. Uh, and that is a very convenient story to impose and maintain domination systems. Now, my most recent book, uh, Nurturing Our Humanity, uh, which came out with Oxford University Press last year, uh, really addresses that question, among others, uh, and shows that, for one thing, uh, we're asking the wrong question. Uh, human nature is not fixed. Um, we have the capacity for caring, for consciousness, for creativity, but we also have, obviously, capacities for insensitivity, cruelty, destructiveness, violence. The What we know today from neuroscience, and the academy is being very, very, very slow in incorporating this knowledge, and it, the academy is so siloed, the universities are so siloed, so fragmented, that it, well, maybe you have this information in a course on neuroscience or an occasional course on psychology, whereas it should be part of sociology, it should be part of political science, of economics, because what we today know is that this question of nature versus nurture is a really nonsensical question, because what we know from neuroscience is that nothing less than how our brains develop, how our brains develop, uh, is a function of the interaction of genes with our environment, especially during our first years of life, when we are even more malleable and more flexible. Um, these are the years when we know from the years from zero to three, 85 percent of brain structures are formed. So, 
And uh, what my work shows uh, is that neuroscience today supports the conclusion that how our brains, and hence how we feel, how we think, how we act, including how we vote and work and everything else, uh, that these are very different depending on the degree to which our cultural environments orient to the partnership or domination side of the scale. Uh, in other words, as mediated, of course, by families, by education, by religion, politics, economics, and so forth. So that is really changing our story and nurturing our humanity and all my books, uh, starting with The Chalice and the Blade, which now, by the way, is in, um, what is it, 57 U.S. printings and 27 foreign editions, they tell a different story, a more accurate and realistic and inclusive story of our human adventure here on Earth. Okay, so this is fascinating to me, um, this idea of saying, okay, human nature is not fixed. So in other words, the discussion of are we um, by nature dominating or focused on partnership is the wrong question. You're saying we have the capacities for both and that then our individual capacities are brought out depending on what culture that we're born into. And then most of that is set at an early age. So uh, from that standpoint, then um, as individuals, we need to understand how that process happened to ourself, I suppose, in order to, break out of things that we need to break out of. Absolutely. And the good news is that actually, if you want to really look at what we're so called wired for, uh, we humans are, are in some very real uh, sense, uh, physiologically, biologically wired more for partnership rather than domination relations. However, uh, domination systems suppress those capacities. Uh, for example, I, I'll just give you one example uh, of, of a study that is uh, discussed in uh, Nurturing Our Humanity. Uh, we receive neurochemical rewards of pleasure, not only when we are cared for, but when we care for others, uh, whether it's a mate or a friend or a child, even a pet, right? We feel good. Uh, however, um, domination systems reward, reward, uh, and really make it seem normal uh, as we see in, in some U.S. subcultures, uh, to think only in terms of in-group versus out-group terms, uh, so that you may be kind to the people in your in-group, but the out-group, um, the other, is labeled as not only inferior, but dangerous. And this starts, and this is why I... Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the partnership domination scale does not marginalize the majority of humanity, women and children. It starts really with the model that we internalize uh, for gender. That's right, because we're so used to thinking of gender as, quote, just a women's issue, right? Which is kind of idiotic because women are half of humanity, more or less, uh, you know, I mean, making allowance for sexual orientations and whatever. Uh, but uh, what, what, what we miss here is that we humans really uh, have an enormous capacity uh, for caring. But when you are brought up with this model of our species where the difference in form between male and female is equated 
with either superiority or inferiority, with dominating or being dominated, with being served or serving, uh, children internalize a template for equating difference, whether it is based on race, whether it's based on religion, whether it's based on sexual orientation, with, uh, yeah, with superior, inferior, uh, and, and we have really internalized this to varying degrees, but it is particularly strong in cultures that orient to the domination side. As I said, whether they're Eastern or Western, Northern or Southern, religious or secular, a rightist or leftist. I mean, Stalin, for example, uh, when he came into power, he reversed what little had been done under Lenin uh, to equalize relations in families. Uh, you know, you, uh, you, abortion again became a very, you know, heinous crime, right? Uh, illegitimacy. I mean, all of a sudden, some children were considered illegitimate. How can a child be illegitimate? But a child's a child, right? But he wanted a return, as do the people pushing us back to the so-called traditional, which is a code for an authoritarian, rigidly male-dominated, a uh, highly punitive family. And the good news, however, is that even some people who are brought up in these families, if they just glimpse that there is another possibility, they reject that. That's the good news. The bad news is that a majority of people who are brought up in rigid domination families are very likely to uh, really even vote for strongman leaders and to think only in in-group versus out-group terms. Where did this turn happen? I mean, there's a I've tried to dig into this and get different people's um, analysis and perspective on where I, I know it wasn't one thing. I recognize it was probably a series of many events that led us to where we are now, but I feel like the whole planet is now engulfed in a dominator system. Um, there might be small pockets of partnership societies that exist, but they've been largely pushed to the margins or wiped out. Um, and, you know, I, I think it is important to know from whatever way you can, you know, ascertain this information, but what turn was there? What, what, how did the dominator system become the dominating paradigm on the planet? I assume that wasn't always the case. Um, well, let me uh, again back up and uh, really um, say that we would not be having this conversation. Uh, we'd be killed, burnt at the stake, even in, in Western societies, right? If we had, if we were having this, trying to have this conversation in the European Middle Ages, or even trying to have this conversation in places that today are still very much oriented to the domination side. So, I don't think that uh, we have a rigid domination system anymore, uh, but we certainly have an inheritance of domination structures and traditions of domination. Uh, and the problem is that uh, if you ro really stay stuck in the conventional categories of right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern, a colleague of mine calls these categories weapons of mass distraction because they fragment our consciousness. So we cannot see the foundational elements that we have to change, starting with family, family, which is childhood and gender, okay? So, but let me, let me, let me answer your question. Um, when did the shift take place? Because, uh, the chalice and the blade and 
fast forwarding, you know, skipping many other books that I've written to, to nurturing our humanity, we now know that for millennia, for millennia of our existence as a species on this earth, uh, actually our culture is oriented more to the partnership side. I had worked on nurturing our humanity for seven years when I invited my co-author, the anthropologist Douglas Fry, uh, to join me because, among other things, uh, Douglas Fry is one of the world's leading authorities on foraging societies. In other words, gathering hunting societies. And he calls them the original partnership societies. Now, this was for millennia. And as I note in starting really already with the chalice and the blade and then in sacred pleasure where I trace this very, uh, this, this shift, uh, focusing on sexuality and spirituality and how both got transformed, um, all the way to, to nurturing our humanity. Uh, what, what we now find is that uh, we, had a shift. Uh, the partnership orientation, not ideal, okay, but more equitable, more gender balanced without the ranking of one form of humanity over another and less violent because you don't need violence and abuse to maintain rigid top-down rankings, whether it's man over man, man over woman, race over race, religion over religion, etc. Uh, that really did not uh, change in many, I mean, for example, in Chatalhuyak, which is a early farming society in Anatolia, uh, you still had more of a partnership orientation. And there are many theories to get to your question as to why the shift happened. Uh, and one theory is that it was the advent of agriculture uh, and more complexity is another theory. Uh, and another theory, which is actually beginning to get some support uh, from um, uh, DNA studies of all things um, is that uh, at least in Europe and probably uh, uh, certainly also in India, it was the advent of the so-called Indo-European Kurgan uh, invasions of a pastoralist, nomadic, uh, violent uh, culture that overran the more partnership-oriented uh, parts of uh, of the world. But whatever it is, the good news, again, is that it hasn't always been that way, contrary to what, you know, the caveman cartoon, right? You know, in one hand, he's got a club. With another hand, he's dragging a woman by the hair. So what, 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 we, and we show this to children, before their brains, much less their critical faculties, are fully formed, and the message is, well, uh, violence, male dominance, inequity, that, that's just how it's always been and by implication how it always has to be. So no, it doesn't have to be that way. But the really important thing, and maybe we can talk a little about this, is that the struggle for our future today is not between East and West and North and South and Right and Left and Religious and Secular, but between orientation to partnership and domination within all these cultures, and that for at least 300 years, as I said, in the West since the European Middle Ages, we have been moving towards the partnership side, punctuated by periodic regressions. I wanted to bring in the environment as a topic here, because I feel as though that's related uh, both historically and currently. And in my own uh, studies and in my own practices, um, I have been coming into contact with uh, the um, the gathering and hunting uh, practices that you were 
that you mentioned earlier. Like in the Western United States, there are still people who are attempting to practice out on the margins uh, what they call wild tending, where they are it's a pre-agricultural form of interacting with plants and with environments. So it has to do with planting things, seeding things. Uh, it also has to do with um, setting fires to tend to certain um, to certain um, landscapes to keep them in certain ways. And when you mentioned earlier about how the brain gets a reward when we're caring for people or a pet, I thought to myself, well, I think this also connects to uh, we probably also get rewards when we're dealing in a caring way with our immediate environments. Well, I think we, we probably do. I hadn't thought of that. And thank you for bringing that up. Um, y you know, I mean, really, uh, what you made me think about are the progressive environmental, uh, social, uh, movements over the last 300 years, they've all challenged the same thing, a tradition of domination. And uh, I think that we really need to understand and uh, f look at our history from, if you use what, what in we call the biocultural partnership domination lens, uh, you see patterns uh, and you find answers in what otherwise seems random and disconnected. So the environmental movement is really challenging a tradition of domination, our once hallowed conquest of nature, right? Domination of nature that at our level of technological development could really do us in. I mean, we're seeing it with climate change. Uh, but it, 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 I, I really want to uh, to to use a, a few moments to sort of recast modern history uh, from the perspective of the tension between the domination and partnership systems. Because starting with the uh, so-called uh, men's rights enlightenment, uh, what was challenged? The so-called divinely ordained right of men uh, 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 you know, kings and nobles and so on to rule over inferior so-called people, you know, the quote, common people, right? Then came the feminist and then the women's rights and women's liberation movements challenging again the so-called divinely ordained right, you know, another tradition of domination of men to rule over the women and children in the, quote, castles, you know, a military metaphor of their homes. Then came the abolitionists, the civil rights, the anti-colonial movements, the Black Lives Matter movements today, again, challenging another tradition of domination, the so-called divinely ordained right of a supposedly superior race to rule over supposedly inferior ones, uh, all the way to the movements for social and economic justice, to the anti-violence movements, not only the peace movement, but the more recent movement, which is fundamental, challenging traditions of what I call intimate violence, the global pandemic of violence against women and children, which uh, I, I've written about uh, extensively in many articles, as well as in books, uh, again, it challenges this tradition of domination and violence, right? And the violence needed to maintain it. Uh, so that's, again, the good news. The bad news is that most of these movements have focused primarily on dismantling the so-called top of the domination pyramid, politics and economics as conventionally defined, but they've left the foundations on which the pyramid keeps rebuilding itself, starting with childhood, with gender, uh, with economics and yes, story and language, are pretty much intact and marginalized. And this is particularly true of so-called educated people, uh, because the people who are pushing us back 
knowing their gut, you know, as I said, whether, I mean, the rightist fundamentalist alliance in the United States, so-called, which is really a domination alliance, uh, spent enormous resources uh, on pushing the normative ideal for family back to this, quote, traditional authoritarian, rigidly male-dominated, uh, punitive family. Uh, and for many progressives, these are just women's issues and we've got to, or children's issues, and we've got to change that. In a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... I feel like this is actually the deeper work of feminism, um, because I think that that's the one of the most ignorant um, and ill-informed perspectives that I hear about feminism is that feminism is about, you know, putting women on top, that they're going to be the, the top of the hierarchy and that men are going to be relegated to the bottom again, or, or, you know, where women resided in a patriarchal system. But what it seems to me is the, the more nuanced and, and truer um, work that's being done within feminism is to say, actually this dominator system using your terminology or patriarchy is just as hard it's, it's definitely harmful for women it's definitely harmful for children um, but it's harmful for men as well and it doesn't allow men to be in true partnership with other genders with other people it inhibits their ability to be vulnerable um, to actually recognize the strength in partnership versus in domination so to me my, I just want to speak personally here, which is that so much of that in me that I've internalized growing up in this culture and in this time is based in a kind of uh, 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 trauma, I think. And it feels to me intergenerational. So I'm curious about there's an I think there's a neurological and psychological base to this um, that you've you know alluded to talking about childhood development. Um, but, you know, so much of this work to me really stems from this fact that there is a, I don't know how many generations of deep trauma that is giving us the false idea of what, um, you know, a truly fulfilled and meaningful life is supposed to be like, you know, what it means to really be a part of a healthy culture and society. Um, you know, tying into the first question that I asked at the beginning of this about what's going on in the U.S. right now, you know, we're seeing, I see that a dominator impulse uh, rearing its ugly head right now. It is fearing that it won't be in control any longer. So it's trying to exert itself through what we're seeing right now. I, I don't need to be too specific, but I think we have the same idea of what that is. Um, so what I see, though... Well, I the, think you're, yeah. you're right. Yeah. I just say, I just see in the actions of these people more and more, it's like, yeah, I'm afraid of it because I know what it can lead to. I understand history enough to recognize that. But I also just see a lot of people in a lot of confusion and pain and trauma. They're acting out of a trauma. So I'm curious about your research. How much does trauma play a role in dominator culture and dominator paradigms? I, I can answer that f first with one quick sentence, which is that domination systems are trauma factories, mm. starting in childhood and then going into the economics, uh, into uh, the very rigid gender stereotypes, uh, everything, I mean, is really, look, I mean, uh, let's go back to the European Middle Ages for a minute with public executions of, of disemboweling people, of drawing and quartering people. I mean, uh, talk about socially induced trauma. And unfortunately, a lot of our entertainment is also designed to completely desensitize people to violence, in case you haven't noticed. Uh, but the system really requires trauma to maintain itself. And that's one of the 
、uh, messages from nurturing our humanity.、Uh, but this said, we can change this. I mean, even the American Psychological Association last year finally came out with a statement saying that spanking, which is a relatively mild form of violence. Uh, is harmful. That it's not only ineffective, but it is psychologically and physically harmful. Now, I mean, we have the knowledge today to really、uh, change traditions of domination, starting with、uh, childhood. But see. When I say that domination systems are trauma factories, I wrote a book on economics called "The Real Wealth of Nations," and that takes me to the third cornerstone, of course, that we have to rebuild from domination to partnership.、Uh, domination systems create artificial scarcity and hence trauma, and they not only do this by misdistribution of resources. You know, to the top, and that's that's not just capitalism, by the way. I mean, if anything, capitalism is a milder form of domination than. I mean, go back to Chinese emperors, to、uh, Arab sheiks,、uh, to Genghis Khan, to I mean, you had、mm-hmm. <laughs> really.、Yeah. I mean, think about our history, for goodness sakes, to medieval. You know what I mean. The way that I describe、uh, so-called trickle-down or neoliberal economics, it's really a contemporary version of the notion that those on bottom from feudal times, you know, those on bottom, as in feudal times, should content themselves with the scraps dropping from the opulent tables of those on top. Nothing different. It's、right. a tradition of domination. But it also creates artificial scarcity, and this is really important, by devaluing the work of caring for people, starting at birth. You know the so-called women's work, right?、Uh, and that is built into both capitalist and socialist theory. I mean, people bandy around the word socialism now, but it stood for very specific things: It's no private property, and the relegation of 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 the three life-sustaining sectors of the household, the volunteer community economy, and the natural economy as quote externalities. Re- Whatever contributions they make, at both capitalist and socialist theory label reproductive rather than productive, and in purely economic terms, okay, as I point out in the real wealth of nations, as well as in, of course, nurturing our humanity, in our post-industrial knowledge service era. When we hear so much from economists about what they like to call high-quality human capital, you know these flexible, creative people who can work in teams, who can are resilient, who can really adapt to change.、Uh, whether we have that or not, largely hinges on what is left out of economics as conventionally defined. The quality of care and education that children receive early on. So my work really、uh, is an inclusive model of society, and once we see the whole of society, we can see patterns, which I've called the domination system and the partnership system, and we also see that we can and must change four cornerstones. So that we can stop having these regressions, because we've seen movement forward.、Uh, I mean, we, you know, I mean the challenge to slavery, the challenge to、uh, racism, the challenge to sexism. These are all attempts to move to leave behind traditions of domination, aren't they? The challenge to economic injustice, the challenge to the destruction and despoilation, which. By the way, the exploitation of nature is integral to both 
capitalist and socialist theory. There was nothing in them about caring for our natural environment. We need new thinking. And this is what this work offers. You know, as Einstein said, we cannot solve problems with the same thinking that created them. So I invite our listeners to really uh, read these books, uh, read the articles, go to centerforpartnership.org, go to partnerism.org, because we just launched a Make Partnerism Mainstream campaign. Uh, it's the new thinking and the new actions that we need in order to have solid foundations for a society that is more just, more equitable, more regenerative and sustainable, a partnership society. I've done some, I, what, what you were just saying reminded me of, I've done some reading about the gathering and hunting cultures in which it was pointed out that with women doing a lot of the gathering and men doing a lot of the hunting, this ended up being very equal because in a lot of these societies, the gathering was actually more important than the hunting, it was actually the basis of the diet. The hunting tended to augment it. And so when what we call what was considered women's work and what were considered men's work were both uh, considered equally as important in the society, then women had equal power. That was the partnership then. And so, yes, we're now stuck with this place for the time being that we need to move past where the work that women do is considered extra. Well, I think it's work that men can also do, and a lot of younger and even older men are breaking out of the, really the straitjackets of the domination systems, gender stereotypes. So we see men uh, feeding babies, diapering babies, doing this so-called women's work. I, I think that what, what you said earlier, which is that domination systems are bad for everyone, is the truth. But in domination systems, you have only two alternatives as you grow up. You either dominate or you're dominated. You don't experience or observe a partnership alternative. And that, I mean, we see that writ large today in the, in, 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 in Donald Trump. Uh, you know, he says it's all about domination. For him, there is no partnership alternative. And, and so, he, and he came by this, I'm sure, through his childhood from what, uh, you know, the book by his niece describes his family. Oh my gosh. I mean, it was a nightmare, wasn't it? So, but we don't have to perpetuate this. We can change it. And when, I mean, people who grew up sometimes in these families, uh, as I said, not everyone who does uh, accepts this. I mean, so there is a great deal of hope, but as long as we're stuck in fighting each other, right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern, we really don't go to the basics. And so I've proposed like for economics, a caring economics of partnerism in which, yes, caring, you know, this soft feminine, work of caring, caring for people starting at birth and caring for nature are the guiding principles. Can you imagine what an economic system like that would be like? Of course you can. There are trends in that direction. And by the way, there are nations in Northern Europe who have more partnership policies. Uh, they have very generous paid parental leave parental for both men and women. And in Sweden, for example, and in Norway, if both, if in a two parent, you know, male, female family, uh, they don't both take the parental leave, neither gets it. So men are spending more time with their children, getting those endorphins, those rewards of pleasure. Uh, they have, of course, universal health care, universal child care, high quality, uh, child care, uh, elder care with dignity. And yes, they, uh, you know, have more awareness of our environment. 
uh, and protecting it and caring for it. So, and, and we see in the United States, a lot of people have partnership attitudes and not coincidentally, uh, many of them, but not all of them are also beginning to question the old in-group versus out-group gender stereotypes. And that's why we're back to childhood, to gender, to economics, building a caring economics of partnerism, and changing our stories and our language as cornerstones, cornerstones that we must ch shift from domination to partnership so we don't keep having these regressions. I think the thing that I have really I have a really hard time with is I I completely agree with you that I'm seeing partnership um, societies or partnership dynamics emerge. I mean I'm I'm on a place right now where I'm talking to you right now and I'm seeing a real community um, having emerged here. There is partnership. There is work that's being done together to build something better and healthier here. Um, but it's so to me it feels very fragmented. It feels like you can go out and find little islands of of this partnership, of this healthy cultures. Um, people are creating these pockets of, of sanity, I guess. Um, and then I see, I mean, at large, I see things kind of moving in the other direction. And I tend to get a little disillusioned because I feel like the dominators, the dominator culture is going to do whatever it can to hold on and to reassert itself. As you said, we fall back into regressions. Um, I'm curious, like how you're perceiving all of this playing out. I, I have a hard time being optimistic about the future when I see that the dominators in this culture at large have all the weapons, have all of the systems of, of governance and power at their disposal. Um, it's to me, I think it's almost a cruel joke that it's absolutely, we, we lean, I think, towards partnership and caring for one another but the dominators have all the weapons. <laughs> they have the they have the mechanisms of power right now. So, I mean, have you looked at any historical examples or contemporary examples of of a society that is embroiled in a dominator mindset um, actually moving towards partnership? Um, what, what in your mind does it take for that to occur on a broader scale? Well, it takes dislocation, it takes disequilibrium. I mean, Germany is a good example. Germany has been moving towards partnership. Uh, it's one of the Northern European nations that has been instituting uh, better policies. By the way, my book, um, The Real Wealth of Nations, as we speak, uh, will be, is being translated into German, abridged, um, and updated with a new title, The Ignored Foundations of Economics. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think that let's step back a little and look at what's happening right now with the COVID-19 pandemic. What we're seeing is that our old social and economic institutions that orient to domination are not able to meet the crisis. Uh, they are not resilient. Uh, they are basically, uh, and, and who are the essential workers? The people who care for others, right? Health care workers, uh, child care workers, the people who provide food. Uh, it is a time of dislocation. And I think while I certainly understand what you are saying, uh, look, I look at it this way we shifted from a partnership cultural direction to a domination cultural direction so we can shift back and we have been shifting back but i cannot emphasize this enough if we do not change the four foundations that i've been talking about then the domination systems will keep rebuilding themselves uh be they as, uh, you know, totalitarianism, as fundamentalism, religious fundamentalism is domination fundamentalism. And why do you think that whether it was for Hitler in Germany, Khomeini in Iran, the Taliban, the Rightist Fundamentalist Alliance in the United States, ISIS, a top priority is always 
either maintaining or returning to a quote, traditional, which is a code word for authoritarian, rigidly male dominated, highly punitive family, because in their gut, they recognize this. Now take progressives, you know, who tend to be more educated people. What do we learn in our universities? Well, it's very, very interesting because out of about 600 or so years of mod so-called modern science, right? Which by the way, as the historian of science, David Noble writes in his book, A World Without Women, originated in a completely male, celibate, misogynist, clerical culture, right? And I would say it was a world not only without women, but a world without children. And then you only 50 years ago, 50 years ago, out of all of that time, do we even start to have women's studies, men's studies, gender studies in our universities? They're still marginalized you know, off to one side rather than integrated. And as I said, as for what we know from neuroscience about really how our brains develop and the cultural aspects of that, if anything, it's just in a course here and there uh, in the neuroscience course or in the psychology course, rather than being integrated into sociology, anthropology. Uh, so no wonder so many progressives still think of anything to do with gender or childhood as just a women's or children's issue when it is central, central to the kind of society we have. And as for economics, uh, this whole argument between capitalism and socialism is totally beside the point. We need a caring economics of partnerism and it's not just working together. I really want to emphasize that it's a cultural configuration. People work together in domination systems all the time. Uh, oil cartels work together, monopolies work together, uh, criminal gangs work together. Uh, but it is a configuration of leaving behind this top-down authoritarian rule in both the family and all the social institutions, leaving behind the rigid gender stereotypes, which make it possible to rank one half of humanity over the other, and hence do this in-group versus out-group thinking as ingrained in us, uh, uh, changing patterns of violence and abuse, because they're not really needed unless you have domination systems, and yes, changing our story, changing our language. That's what we're talking about, not just working together. I think I'm a little more optimistic than Patrick, even though it feels a little funny to say <laughs> that, because I look at our current situation and at the youth and the ideas that the youth have and the actions that the youth are taking and I really feel like we might be at the beginning of another youth rebellion, such as happened in the 60s, but that this one has the potential to be bigger and to have uh, bigger shifts. Uh, do, you, have you, do you have a similar sense about the youth today? Uh, I do, but there's a big caveat here. Because in the 60s, we confuse rebellion with reconstruction. And... You would not build a house without really building solid foundations for it, would you? So I want to reach young people with this new understanding. Leave behind the old thinking. You know that it isn't working. Uh, you know that uh, it keeps us trapped. And think in terms of rather of the biocultural partnership domination social scale. And I think that's a good place to end our, our conversation if that, uh, that really everything that we think about, whether it's political systems, economic systems, family systems, they're human creations. 
we can change them. But to change them, we have to have a roadmap, a plan of what it is that we want, not just to deconstruct, to rebel, but to reconstruct. And yes, that's what this work is about. That's what all of my books are about. Uh, and it does require thinking in completely different ways. We hear about thinking from the bottom up. Well, let's really think from the bottom up, from childhood, from gender, uh, from economics that are caring for people starting at birth and caring for nature, and from the really the bottom up, because we humans live by stories, changing our stories and as we are told by linguistic psychologists, the categories provided by languages of a culture channel our thinking. So it's almost impossible to think of other alternatives, leave behind right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern. Remember that there have been repressive and regressive and violent regimes in all these categories, none of them tell us what we need to do to build a more just and caring and sustainable and regenerative world. Uh, try this new way of thinking. Uh, be informed, inform others, because it starts with our worldview. And I believe in human creativity uh, unleashed in service of partnership. And I'm, of course, it's not going to be easy. But this time, this pandemic really is an opportunity, isn't it, to rethink and reconstruct rather to, than to just protest and deconstruct. And that is where I put my hope, uh, in, certainly in young people, but also in older people who have lived for a while and who have seen that the old ways of thinking don't work and who really are hungry for a new worldview. And that's what this work offers. Yeah, I think, you know, the, what makes your work so important and has been so important for so long is not only do you, do you show that things can be different and things are different if we choose to look at it. Um, but, you know, you frame it in a way where, yeah, there is this sense that, yeah, partnership is emerging um, as a paradigm. Again, it has never fully disappeared. It's always been present. We just have to emphasize it. Um, and getting to the root of it, which is, you know, as you said, talking about children, childhood development, um, how we understand and perceive reality in our relations with other beings, human or non-human life. Um, and I think, again, I think I speak for Calibri as well, that your work has been incredibly valuable in getting to the root of that. Um, and we really thank you for your time. Uh, and Calibri, did you have any more questions that you'd like to ask? Because I would just ask oh, her that, if she had any upcoming mm -hmm. projects. Oh, that was it? Okay. Yeah, I was just going to ask uh, Dr. Eisler if you had anything else you wanted to say as far as projects that you're working on, any upcoming books or events or anything like that that you'd like to share with us before we go. Well, I would like to point people to two websites and as well as to my books. Um, but the two websites are centerforpartnership.org and our new, brand new website for the Making Partnerism Mainstream Campaign. And that website is partnerism.org. And remember, none of us can do everything, but every one of us can do something. We're talking about human agency. And uh, I am a firm believer in human creativity once unleashed, that it can help us overcome uh, many obstacles, but most importantly, build these four partnership foundations uh, so that we can have a better world, a world that works better for everyone. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA.
on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.